so let's begin part uh, our part three part our video part two of this lesson. So our our composition of function. So to begin that, we're going to do a little bit of a backwards track. We're going to start with the scaffold from Algebra 1, and then we're going to talk about function operations. Um, but just a reminder about our community property. So if we solve for f of 2 and g of 2, given these functions over here, what is that going to look like? So when we plug that in, we get 7. When we plug that in, we get 7. And this just reminds you of your commutative property, which simply tells me that using any combination, when I do addition, subtraction, multiplication, or sorry, not subtraction, but addition and multiplication, if I move those around, then they're going to have the same effect, right? A plus B is going to be B plus A. A times B is going to be B times A. That is just my commutative property. You know it, you just may not have remembered the word. Another uh, like rewind is our function operations. And there's two on here I didn't put, but you should be able to figure that one out. If I did f plus g or f minus g, you simply take that function and you plug in for plus or minus. Well, here, I just wanted to remind you that this dot right here, filled in, means that I'm doing multiplication. So, you know, this means that function f is multiplied by function g. So I take those two functions, I do a simple FOIL, and I get my answer here, it is simplified and in its factored form. What happens when I do g divided by f or any fraction of it? It just, you know, that, that fraction just means division, and then I plug it in. I can't simplify this one, so I'm just going to leave it the way it is. This is just a reminder of function operations. And why are we talking about that? Because we're about to transition into composition of functions. So, what is a composition? This just comes from the concept of combining our linear functions. So, um, or combining functions. It doesn't have to necessarily be linear, but in this one, this example combines a linear function within a squaring function. Um, it doesn't use addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division in the standard sense of operation functions. We may simplify throughout, but we're not, that's not what we're doing. We're literally taking one function and placing it within another function. So here's our notation that's so important. Here we have another dot, but this time it's an open circle. It's not filled in. That means we're talking about composition. We can also see it in our bracket forms. So f composed g of x, that's what this says. So we'll read this as f composition g, where the function g is applied first and then the function f. So my g is within, so I start with my g, then I go to my f. Okay, that's what that says. And then if I read it here, f composed g, that means I do g first, then f. Okay, so here's an algebraic solve. Here's our example. We have these two functions, f and g. So we're going to do f composed g. That means I'm going to evaluate g inside of f. So that means here's my g in red, x minus 4, within my f, inside of my f. So I'm going to take that g and place it in the x variable for every one for the f function. So in this one, we only have 1. So we're going to do x minus 4 squared plus 1. I simplify that. That's a FOIL or a factor or however you want to call that. That's We FOIL it out. And we simplify down to x squared minus 8x plus 17. How about what happens when I do g composed f? So again, uh, this is backwards, that should say G composition F, but here's the correct notation, G composed F. So here is my F, I start with my F within, and then I'm going to expand it to my G. So I'm going to take this, which is right here, and place it every time I see an X in G of X. And I did that, I simplify, and I get X squared minus 3. So just a reminder what the first one looked like. Okay, that was x squared minus 8x plus 17. So, let's tie back into that commutative property. Are all compositions commutative? Let's look at what we just did. We just f composed g, we got one answer, and then g composed f, and we got a completely different answer. So, no, not all compositions are going to be commutative. It might happen. It could happen, but as we just saw, it will not always happen. We just saw an example where it is not commutative. Okay, what happens when they want to do a numeric solve? So they give you f composed g of 2. Well, that's easy. I do the composition and then I plug it in the same way you always do numeric solves. So 
We've already done f composed g, so I'm going to have you recall that f composed g of x was equal to x squared minus 8x plus 17. That was the first solve we did. Then we just plug in 2. So 2, 2, solve it down, and we got 5. Oops, solve it down, and we got 2, 5. It's as simple as that. All we have to worry about is doing the composition correctly. Okay? Finally, why do we do compositions? Because compositions are what we can use in the real world. They have real world applications. In this one, we have a video game designer trying to figure out, okay, I've got this base, uh, base pixel, base rectangle, but what happens when I'm trying to adjust it for different sizes? And guess what? We can do that with some simple compositions. So here's my question. To animate the approach of an opponent directly in front of a player, a computer game animator starts with an image of a 20, by, uh, 20 pixel by 60 pixel rectangle. The animator then increases each dimension of the rectangle by 15 pixels per second. So we have three questions to kind of get through our real world application. So the first one simply says, find the functions to model the data. I provided these variables for you. However, in a real question, on a real quiz or a test, or in the real world, you create function model names, you use the letters that are appropriate to what's happening. So, you know, we're gonna figure out, uh, model the data, so we need to know L for length, that's pretty simple, and A for area, so we're gonna do that. All right, first things first, let's look at what we were given. We were given an image that is 20 pixels by 60 pixels, and we know that each dimension is increasing by 15 pixels per second. So if I wanna know the length, or I don't know, I just kinda of like, but if I wanna know one of these, the length, then I know that as it continues, it started at 20, so it has an initial value of 20, but it's going to increase every second, and second, is simply a measure of time. So guess what our variable is going to be? It's not going to be x, it's simply going to be t, which is our x variable. It is our independent variable, but we're going to use time. So, let's answer this question. The length of the rectangle is increasing at a rate of 15 pixels per second. So that must mean that my length starts at 20 and every second I add on 15. So that becomes 20 plus 15 times the second. So. 15 times zero seconds, that's where I initially started, that's just gonna be 20, that's what I was given. But at the first second, we're gonna do 20 plus 15. Second second, 20 plus 15 times two, which is 30. Kinda makes sense. My time must be greater than or equal to zero. Time can't be negative, so that's an easy qualifier. The next thing we need to know is look at the area. What is area of a rectangle? It's simply length times width. Well, I could put my length and put times width, but that gives me too many variables. So let's get it in terms of our length. So in terms of our length, what do I know? Let's go back to that little triangle or rectangle that we drew. And in terms of our length, we know that there's a relationship here, 20 to 60. What's that difference? Okay, 20 plus 40 is gonna get me to 60. So what's the ratio, the relationship between length and width? My width is simply length plus 40. So we're gonna use that information in our next one. The area of the rectangle is length times its width, yada, yada, yada. So my width is 40 pixels more than its length. Therefore, my width is L plus 40. So my area is going to be my length times my width, and I got it in terms of one variable, my length. Or area is equal to L squared plus 40L. Now, you guys might be asking, why isn't it in terms of T? Or why didn't I plug this in here? That's our very next step. Okay, but before we move forward, let's make sure we note here, L had to be greater than or equal to 20 because that was our initial value. We can't start below that. Where did the T go? So let's do a composition, A composed of L. This means composition, uh, this means A composition of L or, here's that, that notation that we can also use. So I take my L first, then I place it within my area. So that, that area was L squared plus 40L, so that becomes 20 plus 15 T squared plus 40 times 20 plus 15 T. Okay, I simplify it down, and this gives me an area formula in terms of T. So that's what the composition did. It gives me, my, it models my area as a function of time. So that's how we get that connect back. That's why composite functions are so important to us. 
okay? And here's the real world application. How long does it take for the rectangle to triple in size? How many seconds? That's what it's asking, how long? How many seconds or how much time? So that's a simple solve, right? I take my composition, a, uh, oh, well we started somewhere a little different, sorry. The initial area of the rectangle is 20 times 60 because we were given that information, which is 1200 pixels. So what happens when we're looking for three times that? That's simple, 12 times, or 1200 times three, 3600. That's our end goal. But we're searching for how long, so we're solving for t. So my rectangle will be three times the initial size when my composite function, my area in terms of t, is equivalent to 3600. So I solve for t. I plug it into a calculator or something, or if it's a simple solve, then I do it myself. In this fact, in this one, we had to do a calculator, and we got 1.55 and negative 6.88. I can immediately cancel out one of those questions because time cannot be negative. So at approximately 1.55 seconds, the area will triple, and there's my answer. Here's a preview of our exit tickets. Can you do a composition? And could you answer a real-world problem? Thank you.